to Regis Kraft for your remarks. And now, to finish this panel, I will give the floor to Dr. Alejandro Pisanti Baru. Very briefly, Alejandro Pisanti, I'm a doctor in chemistry that has worked in computing since 1992. Velma considers me her friend, and I, I am I, sure I am. I thank Velma Arellan specifically, as well as Sergio Carrera, General Director of Infotech, as well as to Patricia Ara, uh, uh, because they is that I am sure gave uh, their approval for me to be invited here. I'm also bearing an unexpected responsibility, which is being the only person that is not an attorney at this panel. Uh, however, I was given the final um, I was given the final um, uh, opportunity to show my ignorance on this field. Let me just uh, begin with, brief, with some brief remarks and then I will continue with the last uh, um, topics. Uh, Alan Gottmik uh, states that there are three attitudes towards any type of um, innovation in Internet or information technologies. It, he describes it as the never better, the never worse, and the always or ever was. This means going from the hyper-optimism that there has never been something as good as what we currently have, the ultra-pessimists such as Morazzo, uh, Nicholas Carr and others that say that, well, they say it's almost the end of the world, of at least the end of Western civilization, uh, and that those that recognize or uh, say, well, this is the same as it has always been, those that somehow deny the innovation. I am not, I refuse to be technologically pessimist. I am uh, too pessimist to be a total optimist, and I do not think the position of uh, nothing is new to be um, very uh, useful. However, we need to take the positive aspects of all these uh, stances. E-commerce ended up uh, being commerce. Plus, of it, uh, considered that it was the continuation of commerce through other means. Uh, in the same regard, the cloud is not is not anything but a massive data centers with the delocalization that uh, they entail. A large amount of data treatment in between companies and in intranets and so on is nothing. Uh, is none other that we consider the electronic um, exchange of data between companies and even e-commerce might also be regarded just as eddy on steroids or only what uh, happened to anything when it is mounted on an IP um, protocol um, platform. This innovation uh, in which we do not need to receive anybody's uh, approval. Uh, and in this regard, uh, Big data, well, the, the same that, is, that happened with supercomputing hap is happening with big data. The definition of supercomputing is specialized uh, uh, computing. It is the most uh, advanced available calculation uh, capacities in the world. And big data are the most important uh, data anal anal analysis capacities that exist today. We could have uh, started discussing big data since the Hollerick uh, boards were introduced in the first uh, two decades of the 20th century. At that time, we started to have somebody that could collect data as well as uh, um, treat it anonymously um, with regards to the citizens. The data were probably very basic and elemental. The treatment that could be made and the intervention in the lives of people was very uh, limited. However, back then, there was still the construction of this big brother that was uh, identified uh, recently in, 19, uh, in the 40s by Orwell with his novel 1984. But besides this big brother, we had the little brothers, as Mr. Leander uh, said. We had the small, um, have the small data. We do not need big data to know how much the principal of the school spends in, in, in uh, food and drink. This uh, unruly little brothers are at times a bigger risk than the big brother. Uh, so speaking of big data, is, uh, makes it uh, necessary to discuss open data and open government as uh, 
Dr. Puyol already did, uh, because uh, usually it, the state is the main uh, stakeholder in society that has historically possessed or have, have accessed or controlled the larger volumes of data until very recently when uh, Alonso said now electronic transactions, transactions are living records that at times are excessive, that at times are justified. When, for example, we talk about the transition from barcodes to RFID, we go from the standpoint of knowing when chickens are shipped or, un or unloaded for supermarkets to know that um, at a, and in real time what is the temperature of that chicken and know when will the total uh, shipment uh, uh, when the below or above the uh, required temperature levels, for example. This traceability in foods is some, and, and medication is uh, our applications in which we forget uh, uh, big data is being produced, and not only big data, huge data. And um, we need to consider that the large amount of what we are doing with large volumes, with enormous volumes of data, is not uh, something that has been requested from us. It does not correspond to the specifications of a system requested by a client. On the side of IT, we started doing it following the motto or following the answer to the great existential question of Edmund Hillary, the first Westerner to have climbed the Everest. To the question of uh, why did he climb the Everest, he said, because it's there because it's there and that is an answer we obtain from the side of IT to many things that we are currently doing why did you th what did you think about doing it well because we can and in this uh, in some cases it is a very good attitude to know what can be done and that is precisely the road of the most widespread road for innovation there are hundreds of because it's there that are uh, that are very uh, will be buried. Uh, this is a key comment. Some engineers will be happy not to hear any more about law, but think about the amount of skeletons in the closets of a source forge, for example, the amount of uh, software or large uh, software projects that were just there because no client, no healthy community uh, drove them forwards. But that because it's there is a very important reason why we now what we are now delving on big data. We do not analyze risks uh, sufficiently on a broad framework. We discuss privacy and legality, but probably we would win a lot from a, if we were to discuss only about the risk management on big data. And then we would be discussing all disciplines. We would be focusing this uh, to all disciplines. To all disciplines, we could approach with uh, with the standpoint of risk management. Uh, analyzing impact probability, selecting risks in which the product or the summation of those that are on the quadrant of the higher impact or probability, which are the first one that needs treatment are, and all the disciplines to transfer uh, of right risk identification of occurrence, mitigation, response, contingency plans, continuity plans, saying this from the standpoint of all social a actors, the companies, the banks, the banks, for example, have an interest in preventing money laundering, laundering first due to compliance, compliance with legal uh, requirements or uh, being rid of scandals as many banks had, or also for their own financial uh, security because having, um, having amounts coming from money laundering uh, have certain implications for their stability beyond compliance. So. Um, in this society, in this discussion, in which all data generators, data um, analysts, and individuals that enter into the system could uh, engage in a very intelligent conversation to find out how to mitigate the risks that arise from big data when we're dealing with public and private data of individuals. One of the risks, one of the eight layers. Uh, eight-layer risks, not admitted risk. It is the risk that takes place or that arises when this treatment goes to the entire society. And an eight-layer layer risk is not only in terms of uh, privacy, because it is well regulated, but as uh, probably Alberto cannot confess in public, there is the risk of discrimination, the risk of discrimination that begins with positive discrimination that is regarded kindly. 
you will not get offers from the bank that do not correspond to your level of, uh, of risk of transactions of income. You will not get cruise offers if your accounts receive uh, 4,000 pesos a month. You will not get uh, offers from a discount shop if your income and your bank transactions amount to 150,000 pesos a month. But in the process, we might lose a series of opportunities, of opportunities for the citizens not only commercial opportunities that, are, um, that represent a high risk of uh, discrimination. I do not want to take the attitude of uh, saying that the sky is falling down, but this is the sort of things we need to consider when we are looking at this with a broad scope, when we consider the evolution of the systems on a 10-year panorama, and also when the systems are government-owned, when we discuss the, one of the uh, aspects of open government that I would like to emphasize. Uh, just to put in context some of what previous speakers said, there's the treatment of uh, public data by small private organizations of, uh, of um, startups, of uh, commercial ventures, of citizens' organizations focused on specific topics that could go from transportation to others that have a higher political and social impact, such as, for example, de detecting discrimination factors, abuse factors, or uh, any indications of abuse, indications of abuse in public expenditure directed towards um, the population before uh, uh, electoral uh, seasons favor uh, with uh, agricultural credits, certain populations that are, for example, based on an apple, apple analysis or plot by plot of land, an analysis of who they might be induced to vote to by using public funds. This sort of uh, oversaying also has many political aspects, uh, also many aspects in terms of discrimination. Another issue where that we need to start discussing intelligently and intensively between technicians and attorneys with a political view is this issue that has been uh, constantly alluded to, which is de-anonymization, which can take place in several ways. A small surprise is that if you look for, let me give you a very concrete example that I used in the study, the, the information of recipients of certain types of subsidies, in a very specific case we have the uh, a subsidy to agricultural diesel. It is a very important subsidy that reduces the cost of energy for um, for people that work in the, the fields, for agriculturists. Uh, however, uh, in this list, it is very easy to identify numbers of in the names of individuals that were called nylon uh, peasants, that is to say, those that used uh, uh, synthetic fiber clothing instead of their traditional natural fiber clothing. This is people that work in, in companies in, uh, in banks, but that have may, might have pieces of land here and there. And even though these uh, their activities are mostly recreational rather than uh, productive, they can have access to the subsidy to fuel. And we can identify these individuals, and then we might ask, Sh that information shouldn't be publicly available. However, the recipients of these subsidies, the names and the personal data of the recipients of these subsidies are regarded of um, public interest. And so it is a monster that citizens have created themselves based on our transparency requirements without thinking about the greater law that is often neglected in the development of these larger scale systems. That is not the law of protection of personal data or access of information or the civil code or the criminal code or the constitution of the republic or any of, their, of its derivative uh, laws. It is the law of unexpected consequences. With that, I, I mean, at times there are no guilty parties in the law of unexpected consequences. It is the construction by patching up a system. Because when this system is regarded as a whole, there can be this series of uh, behavior uh, that is uh, um, uh, striking, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, there is also the issue of de-anonymization, not only in terms of how Leandro discussed, in which we could say, well, I will reduce from a one million population of which I have data, and then I would eliminate who they are or uh, and by reducing this amount of data, we end up having a, a subpopulation of 500,000 individuals, for example, that have a certain features in terms of age and so on that might be uh, regarded as uh, good people, uh, as the individuals that 
need to be given a message that they have to go to a hospital to get a screening for a disease that they might be carrying or for example the misuse of these large information assets by interested parties for example to identify the most of uh, the population that is more prone to kidnapping or extortion and uh, also uh, considering the enormous amount of data that we produce it is necessary to consider for example mobility through cell phones put in the wrong hands that could very quickly made it possible for somebody to say well this person lives uh, uh, work every Tuesday afternoon but stays a couple of hours at a certain place before going home these are the sort of patterns that could make somebody more prone to extortion, for example. And there's a, a software available for that, and there's also a black market of this sort of software. And this leads us to the problem of de-anonymization, and also the introduction of all the safeguards that us as citizens are looking for. And that produces risk that is not usually considered during risk assessment, which has to do with friction. Most models, most uh, e-business uh, models, assume a very low friction. They assume that everything we wanted to do can be done. That if I want a piece of data, and if I can have access to it, and if I can have access to that data, I can treat it. That the models of electronic uh, commerce or mm, data treatment in general, the more friction uh, they, are, are, they get, for example, more uh, legal authorization uh, requirements, then that produces entry barriers for innovation. Um, to the extent that we need a legal apparatus, a, a team of lawyers that would uh, be backing up uh, this uh, data analysis activities. And, uh, and with that, we're making that all startups and technical and academic research teams of universities or institutions such as Infotech will not be able to enter uh, this uh, field uh, being at a disadvantage compared to you know, large organizations or governments that have uh, better capabilities uh, in terms of analysis or also um, also having uh, reserves for litigation on certain different um, certain operations and I will go to internet governance which was the topic that I was asked to develop by Velma uh, also I have the chance to make this relevant in a, f in a few in a few minutes as you know the internet is a network of networks it is an interconnection of networks some say that the internet is not even a network it is just an agreement networks are created by people by companies by in the by government agencies and what makes them part of the internet is the agreement of connecting them uh, of connecting each other and taking the traffic of those that are connected with me to others that are not part of my own network. In that matter, the Internet is growing in a very decentralized manner. The only agreement that needs to be considered in the Internet is obeying or actually uh, implementing the technical protocols, the IP protocol or the stack of uh, the IP protocol. TCP, it is possible to send traffic without TCP. It can be UDP, uh, such as with the Internet uh, or IP uh, um, calls, not even with traffic control. And any of the protocols that are accepted by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, need to be complied with. And with that, I am already on the Internet. I do not have to implement the net the web because the web is at a higher level actually the dns the domain name service is not part of the internet infrastructure it is actually an application however uh, there are uh, a couple of aspects in which we should agree besides the use of protocols and this uh, has to do with the um, unicity of uh, public ip address as a uh, location you can use whatever ip addresses you want within a network but you need to use public ip addresses that are unique towards the outside of the network and the unicity between the allocation of domain names and the uh, ip networks because every domain names must uh, absolutely uh, absolutely predictably uh, correspond to ip address uh, while these were very very few and it was just MIT 1218 for example the computer had no interest but as this acquired semantics when somebody realized that, that the series of characters on the DNS could be Vancomer for example then that acquired a commercial value then that acquired an industrial property interest and thus this system um, prompted the creation of a specific governance system to um, register particle parameters domain names 
uh, IP addresses and so on. Uh, so, uh, some chart, it says that uh, port 80 of TCP protocol is, is allocated to the HTTP protocol. And that is the record of the technical parameters. And so within, well, a very specific organization, organization was created, uh, organization for assigning names and numbers that does not uh, exceed uh, or is not all uh, internet governance. Governance is used, it is a, a term that was, uh, that was has been poorly uh, copied into Spanish, but governance has to do with all formal and informal uh, agreements, legal or non-legal, that go all the way to the labels, to the RFC 9051 from Netiquette that that uh, suggests not to answer all the um, the jokes we receive as spam on our email. Uh, spam, for example, is regulated, is uh, mal regulated, but it is uh, mal regulated uh, in, our in certain organizations as well as phishing and anti phishing. Uh, what when governments aggressively started to or tried to intervene. And um, in the internet, with the summit of information in 2005, showed that this governance uh, happens with the con with the participation of all actors, uh, government, academic, uh, commercial actors, and civil society stakeholders. And, uh, this is what we know. The the people that hold the stake. This means that they have uh, some interest in the in the proper functioning of the internet, and these are known as multiple actor parties and models, or it is always, or a multi-stakeholder um, model. Some of the hot topics in terms of internet governance are closely connected to the hot topics of big data or open data and open government. Topics is such as privacy and protection of personal data, which have become extremely complex because as uh, Leandro um, Mr. Puyol were saying, the protection of data is very well regulated, but it is just a subset of what we understand as a privacy, uh, uh, a subset that was isolated in the 60s and 70s, arising from the concerns of privacy of individuals because personal information could be uh, accessed uh, when this exist, uh, existed on uh, computing systems. And there had to be regulation about this, however, the disclosure of uh, the personal data, such as in Facebook or as in other uh, types of uh, less personal and more technical means, have made integrity to become data. The separation made when personal data protection was created, when that legislation was created, was to say, well, all other concerns that exist in terms of privacy allude to the intimate lives of individuals, and these are very complicated to address. So. Uh, why the public in public interest uh, subjects have uh, um, uh, have to uh, have lower rights in terms of what can be considered private? We do not care how many lovers a person that is not a public interest individual uh, has, uh, but just the fact that the prime minister friends has um, lovers, for example, it could be a matter of interest to increase the appreciation of the population for individual or to weaken their political stance. That is a very cultural matter, but it is very difficult to regulate because it is a matter of degrees and moments. But we've reached the point where we need to rethink this. Other great concerns associated to this on with regards to internet governance, but that we also need to pay attention to in the world of big data are those that have to do with Snowden's revelations to to, to see the, the, the amount of, of data collected by governments and how it's not al they're not always transparent. Um, although this may sound radical, uh, the best place for your um, information to be treated uh, s secretly has been in the, in the states because there, there's laws, there's courts, even if they, they are in the shadows. So let's, let's ask about the about CISEN in Mexico or the or the Mexi the Russian or the or the um, Chinese intelligence so so th so this led to the I don't know if you remember Wag of the Dog a movie by uh, of where, where Justin Hoffman acts where in the ca there, there's a sexual sc scandal of the president so they invent a dog 
and um, governments such as Brazil and Germany invent that they are angry of the, the fact that they were the, their phone calls were intercepted. To, uh, their presidents and the the the, the real um, phone wasn't um, encrypted. The normal cell phone was the one that was spied on. But they need to create a scandal a scandal to not confess that. Um, th that this was because I, I don't think there's no no prime minister of Germany, Germany or Brazil that doesn't assume that all the governments of the world are interested in s listening to their conversations and that their staff is trying to prevent this. The embarrass embarrassment is that this may happen. The cause, whatever it is, we that this leads us to internet governance and the debate on internet government has governance has to do with how we will regenerate replenish the competence which is quite um hurt right now or how do we adapt to a world where we um well, well there's a this hypothesis of on anonymity and we need to ask ourselves if we're going to be able to rebuild this in the world in the of big data or if we're going to be able to adapt them uh Let's go to a to to another issue. The the part of maintaining information forever, um, some of them open in origin, were men mentioned by Leandro, and I'm going to to mention them in a moment. They have to do with the right to 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 forget. This is going to deal with the people treating data, because the there, there's an analyst. Uh, That said, um, that that said that that there was a court order that that said that Google had to stop showing the information of Mr. Costeja because he was complaining that he he owned money and that that was the first thing in the search search results. So you the the the, the newspaper. C is not forced to censor itself because he has freedom of the press uh, laws supporting them. So this is more of a, an issue of the the judges saying, okay, this is my position, so I'm going to over-interpret this information. So when we spoke of law of unintended consequences, this is one of the paradoxes. I'd say it's um, paradox. Well, yeah, paradoxes that can hurt you. Um, he was known of 100, 200 people who, who had business, and they say, oh, before I do business with you, please explain to me wh why um, you were in a, in a court case. And well, he had been freed, and he, was, um, he paid his debts, etc. And now Mr. Costeja's debts is the most, um, the most famous individual law in the world at least in the legal world. So the consequences of the fact that now it's possible to ask a judge to remove you from a Google search means that we're going to search on Bing or we're going to check on DuckDuckGo or some other searcher that hasn't been penalized. So the absurd of, of this, of churning a different um, layers of the uh, search engine in, in something we, we can't solve in our uh, level of the world can lead us to absurd re uh, restrictions and paralysis even. So aside from the, even if you digitally erased the information, each of us could be, could, could have um, maybe done something that could have been registered by somebody 20 years ago. So te technology regulation can't sub substitute the, this um, uh, the behavior of a human being. So I'm going to close with this, and I thank you for your attention.